Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Fomor, who will speak on relaxation, oscillation, limit cycles, and probably nonlinear limits. Thank you. So I'm very happy to, to be here to talk to the audience on, 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 on the Poincaré. Uh, and, uh, so uh, I'm going to divide me, my talk in two, two parts. In the first part, uh, I'm going to say a few words about, I, I, more or less I will try to put uh, my, what I'm going to do in the first, second part in perspective with the Poincaré, what was done by Poincaré and others at the time of Poincaré and a little bit later. And I'm going to explain what is uh, written on the board. And afterwards, I'll switch to, to more recent uh, things and to some work we, we have done with uh, Martin, who is here. So um, this has been, oh, this is not. Uh, I'm sorry for my poor handwriting. So uh, everything, uh, I, I basically I'll be concerned with uh, uh, limit cycles, and uh, as probably everybody knows, uh, the, the theory and the word limit cycle goes back to the second memoir of Poincaré sur les courbes définies par des équations différentielles. And uh, this is the place where I introduce, this is uh, in chapter six, published in a journal de mathématiques pures et appliquées in 1882. And in the same article, it defines the theory of limit cycles and the, uh, what we call now Poincaré applic application. And the others have explained that before me. And what I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to, to, to say now is that uh, in the, this uh, series of memoirs were about some a purely mathematical problem, but afterwards, at, for a reason I'm going to explain, at the beginning of, of the 20th century, Poincaré became interested in a, a problem of modern science, modern science at this time. This was even the most modern science of this time, which was the propagation of electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, or what he called Hertzian waves, in a long distance. So the first, what triggered the interest of Poincaré in this was the uh, success by uh, Marconi in 1901, and uh, Marconi managed to uh, transmit Hertzian waves across the Atlantic. So this was between a place called Poldu, Poldu, I don't know to pronounce this, in, in, uh, in the western part of United Kingdom, to Canada, to Newfoundland. And uh, this was a, a, a big success because given the, the, the method used at the time for emission of waves and for the reception of waves. I'm going to say a few words on, on that. So Poincaré became interested in, in uh, what Marconi had done, and uh, he wrote a paper in 1910, I'm going to comment a little bit afterward, and <clears throat> about this uh, paper of 1910, but in uh, what is, uh, for, 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 my talk, for my topic, what is important is that in 1908 and 1909, Poincaré uh, delivered a, a few lectures at the Ecole de, de, de Telecommunication in France, and these lectures have been published in Revue d'Electricité, and this was uh, discovered only recently in this publication by, by Giroud. And in, the, in this uh, series of lectures, he, he solved, or considered two problems. One problem which is the one connected with this uh, paper in 1910, was the transmission of electromagnetic waves on long distances. And what, uh, he, he was not the one, first one to, 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 to be interested in that, but the big problem they had for the transatlantic crossing was the, you had the emission in the UK here, the reception in Canada on the other side of the ocean, and of course we know that the Earth is not flat, is round, is spherical, more or less. And so, because of that, the inline transmission, direct transmission by uh, uh, ray, is impossible. So there is no li link. You, have to, you would have to cross the entire of the Earth, which is not possible because the Earth is a too, too good conductor. So 
the only possibility, supposing that outside of the Earth you have an uniform medium, which is not true, so the only possibility was to look for the transmission at the diffraction, uh, the diffraction, you know, across the perpendicular to the straight line to the to the geometrical optics. And what uh, Poincaré did compute in this paper published in 1910 nine, uh, was the amplitude of the diffracted wave. And this is and this amplitude is uh, this is a complicated problem, a difficult problem, by the way, which was considered again by Fock, the Russian mathematician Fock, in uh, in the 1940s. And what he, he he found Poincaré was that the amplitude of the diffraction was of the diffracted wave was too small to explain the reception by Marconi in Newfoundland. So, which was so nevertheless. Uh, uh, Marconi was successful, and at the end of his paper, Poincaré, uh, Poincaré suggests that the reception was made possible because there is a conducting layer in the upper atmosphere, and instead of having a straight propagation, actually, the propagation is in between two conductors, the conductor in the upper atmosphere and the conductor on, uh, on the ocean, and which is actually what happens. And because of, of this bouncing of, of the rays, so the direct or not so direct, but the emission and reception of the wave is possible on long distances. So this was the first, uh, the first part of, of uh, this uh, conference and on the paper in 1910. In, in the second part, which is very short, by the way, he considered the other problem of the, of the posed by the radio waves, which is the generation of oscillations. You have to have electrical oscillation because by uh, the equation of, of Maxwell, you, uh, with a time-dependent uh, current in, a, in an antenna, you radiate some uh, energy outside of the antenna, which, see, which is basically the uh, energy which is received at the other end in Canada. And to have an oscillating circuit, he, he, at this time, it was in 1908. So the only way to, gener to, do, uh, to have oscillating circuit was to have RLC circuit. This is a capacitor, a uh, uh, inductance, and the resistance, R, R or Rho, by the way. And in between, you need to have some amplifying system, a system that feeds energy into the oscillation. And the system used by Marconi and many others, was a arc, electric arc. This electric arc has many instabilities. It's not well understood even yet. And but because of the instabilities, you have an amplification. So the equation for this problem are written here. You have the RLC, which is actually rho L, which is L, and C is H. In point, I'm using the same notation as Poincaré, and the nonlinear element and the amplifying element is contained in this theta function, which is nonlinear. This theta function has a linear and nonlinear part. Actually, uh, uh, it's not absolutely. Uh, Poincaré probably uh, mixed two papers, in, in two, two things in his, in his article in Conference sur Téléphonie Field, because he writes this equation and then he writes another equation which is closer to the truth by connecting, coupling two equations, one equation for X, which is uh, uh, the um, charge of the capacitor, and an equation for the temperature in the arc, arc lamp. So he has a system of two coupled equations, and he claims without proof that this, which is, uh, by the way, but this is true, that this set of two equations has actually stable oscillating solutions. Which comes back, which it's, it's not a system in, in a plane, for a plane flow because there is a second derivative here. It's for three dimensional uh, system. And it, uh, Poincare also uh, gives a, a, a constraint on theta to have sustained oscillation. So, and this paper is apparently the first one, the first paper where there is a connection made. Uh, this was pointed out by Giroud. There is a connection made between the uh, limit cycle and the uh, per periodic solution, periodic in time, periodic solution 
of uh, differential equation, nonlinear differential equation. Stable nonlinear. So the same year, 1908, was the beginning of the modern era of, of, of radio, radio waves, which is the year of the invention of triode by an American inventor called Lee de Forest. And, uh, Lee de For and this uh, triode is the element that replaces the arc in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Marconi and other experiments. So you have an amplifier amplifying uh, element, which is much easier to use than the arc lamp. And the triode of Lee de Forest was much improved by someone called George Abraham, who was the director of the uh, uh, Laboratory of Physics of École Normale, 100 meters from here. And uh, so we are in 1908. So after 1908, before the, because the war was getting close, basically all the research uh, on all sides was becoming completely secret. So there, was, there is almost no publication on this topic between uh, 1908 and after the war, after World War I. So after World War I, there is a first paper by Blondel, uh, I think André Blondel, who uh, Work on the uh, this electrical circuit, the one I've written here, I've, this, I've uh, drawn here, with the arc lamp substituted by by a, a triode. And uh, the Blondel, Blondel wrote an equation I'm going to to show again and again, which is called now Van der Poel equation. So Van der Poel equation, a year later, uh, wrote a paper on the theory of triad oscillations. So it's not very much a theoretical paper. It's only a paper you know, where Van der Poel uh, only writes the equation. With, and he says that this is a good equation for the uh, oscillation, but it does not bring too much uh, argument to prove his point. And his point was only proved in 1926 that this, the equation, I'm, which is called now the Van der Poel equation, has a, a self-oscillating solution. And this is a paper on relaxation oscillation. This is, as far as I'm aware, the first paper where you have this notion of relaxation oscillation that I'm going to, to talk about. And this was published in the London Journal of Science. And Leonard, in 1928, made you know, all the theory of, of the uh, Van der Poel equation in the two limits which are uh, convenient, the limit of small amplitude and the limit of large amplitude. Although uh, the uh, paper by Balthazar, <coughs> how to pronounce, Balthazar van der Poel is a paper uh, which, where the equation, which is a set of two coupled equations of first order, he, so, he solved the equation by a graphical method, geometrical method. So it was not, uh, he, he did not solve the equation by an analytical method, you know, he used only this graphical method, which has also a long history, and which is basically the kind of method which is used nowadays, you know, because when, when you solve me, uh, a differential equation with computers, you are following the same idea as, as Van der Poel, but only with uh, some, some uh, much uh, a big improvement in the technical method, but the idea is the same. And Leonard, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, he, 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 he solved analytically you know, the problem that was considered by Baliena, by Van der Poel. So, uh, this is basically the history, and afterwards, you know, the, of course, you know, I should need a, a hundred blackboards to, to say every, everything that's been done on this subject afterwards, but this is basically sets the stage of the early part of the history of the uh, theory of relaxation oscillation in the, in the, in the, simple dynamical systems. So, let me try to, does it work? So, uh, I, mm, oh, before, uh, before, oh, sorry, uh, before we continue, I should say that this was also found by Giroud. In 1933, in this building, 
this building where we are now, probably in this uh, conference room. There was a, a conference on nonlinear phenomena organized by Van der Poel and others by Russian. And uh, the topic of this conference, it was years ago, the topic of this conference was precisely the relaxation oscillations, 1933. And, and uh, one of the uh, attendees of this conference was Yves Rocard. And some of us, you know, probably have, uh, we have at least Martin and myself and others in this audience have heard uh, talks by, by Yves Rocard, you know, who wrote a, a paper on, um, on the dynamic de vibration, which is still well, no, well known, at least in France. By the way, I should say that some, this is something which is also uh, pointed out in, by uh, Ogiru and others. Uh, uh, you know, may, uh, the paper after Poincaré, you know, Blondel, Van der Poel, etc., never referred to, to and Rocard, in particular, never referred to, to Poincaré. You know. It was only after the uh, Russian came in, uh, 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 Mandelstam and his students, that uh, they began to, to refer back to Poincaré. You know, but the French apparently had completely forgotten, or they didn't want, for some reason, to refer to Poincaré. And from what I remember, you know, of, of classes by Rocard, you know, he never mentioned the name of Poincaré, if, if I remember well. So, now, uh, this is a quotation of a, uh, we are, we are many pure mathematicians here, so uh, this is a very good, a very interesting piece by André Weil, uh, L'Avenir des Mathématiques, and he says that uh, the st study of the equation of Van der Poel and the, of the oscillation called the relaxation is one of the very few questions, very, very few interesting questions asked or posed by the f uh, contem uh, contemporary physics because the study of nature, uh, which was which used to be a, one of the main source of big problems, ma big mathematical problems, seems lately to, to have been more borrowed than the, it has given, which is very much in the style of, so for those of you who, have, who had a chance to meet uh, André Weil, you know, it was a bit uh, critical, you know, a bit ironical, very much in the in Weil spirit. Uh, but it's true, you know, because this was written in 1946. And uh, see if you have a chance to find this piece of, of uh, say, uh, this piece of work by Weil, you know, it's very interesting because yeah, the part devoted to the, to the application is very small, you know, and he has a long development on uh, the um, uh, Riemann, as Riemann uh, uh, hypothesis, and he sees the Riemann hypothesis as the main, the biggest problem by far in mathematics, you know. And uh, I think it, at this time it was maybe a, a way which was original. Of course, nowadays, from what I understand, everybody believes that this is the biggest challenge for mathematics today, you know, the, well conjecture, the Riemann conjecture, but at this time, maybe it was not. So let's follow the advice of André Weil and <laughs> try to, to study the Van der Poel equation. So by the way, this was in 1946, and the uh, mathematization of, of the... Um, Van der Poel equation in the two interesting limits, small nonlinearity, uh, large nonlinearity, was done a just a little bit bad later by uh, Doronitsin in, in, in Soviet Union. And so it, it didn't. So I come back in the history much, much earlier. So uh, uh, the uh, problem of, of uh, limit cycle, if you wish, is the following, uh, following one. You want to describe an, um, mathematically an oscillating phenomena. Uh, so uh, for, uh, an oscillating phenomena, or time periodic phenomena in nature, are very well known. You know, in, they have been known since the Babylonian in the uh, Western Hemisphere and, and, uh, and Meso Mesoamerican civilization in the, uh, in the uh, Western Hemisphere and Babylonian in the Eastern Hemisphere. And, and it is known that uh, you have regular trajectories uh, and, uh, and also non, uh, not so regular trajectories which are due to the planets. So, and so uh, uh, but uh, of course, mostly, and this was explained by Jacques Lascar uh, yesterday, so mostly 
uh, there is no dissipation in astronomical phenomena. Although, if you want to make a clock, I mean, a, a device which, is, uh, that, which oscillates regularly in time, you have to bring energy in the system to balance dissipation. And surprisingly, uh, after all, you know, from the very far away from, from the point of view, from the theoretical point of view, you know, oscillating circuits are just an example of, not, of a, an artificial uh, oscillating circuit, but you have also many other uh, naturally, uh, not, not naturally, uh, artificial oscillating systems. You have the clocks, which have been made since, I don't know, Middle Age and, and even before, which are oscillating regularly in time and which might require a little bit of, of mathematization. Uh, actually, some great scientists were interested in, in the making of clocks. Uh, classically, you have Huygens in the 7th century, and, and Graham was a, a, a British uh, a scientist, less well known than Huygens. So what is the problem if you want to make a clock? If, uh, to make a clock, in general, you have to have a, 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 what is called an escape mechanism. You have to feed energy in the system, and by, when feeding energy, you have to, to keep the system oscillating at a given frequency which is not a trivial problem. So if I, well, yeah. So this is an, the escape mechanism invented by Huygens, uh, perfected by Graham. So you have a, a pendulum oscillating at the end of this wire regularly, but you know that if you leave this pendulum oscillate uh, by itself without doing anything else, the, uh, in the plane of Poincaré, Vx, V being the velocity in X, the position, the angular position of the pendulum, you know that instead of having a closed curve, you will have a spiral going down to the center because of the friction. So what is the escape mechanism? So the escape mechanism is a way to avoid, to give to the system some energy to balance this decay of energy. And this is done in the following way. I hope my explanation will be clear enough. So you have this, this piece is called the anchor. You see? And there is a dented wheel? Uh, tooth. 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 tooth wheel. Tooth wheel. You have this tooth wheel, which is rotating because there is a weight going down. So the tooth wheel has some energy input coming from the uh, motion of this weight in the, gravi in, in the gravity. And because of, of so this anchor oscillates at, a, at, a frequency, at the same frequency as the frequency of the pendulum. It is linked uh, rigidly to the pendulum. And at each time the, this uh, little pins uh, hit the tooth wheel, the pendulum gets a kick, gets a kick from the tooth wheel, because the tooth wheel is the one that receives <laughs> the power. And when it get, does that, it does that at the end, when the, uh, at the, when the pendulum is at the extreme end, end of its, uh, its motion, when it has no velocity. So what happens is that you see that the motion is the following one. You have this spiral inward. And when the pendulum has no velocity, when it is here, it gets a kick. By getting this kick, it moves to the same, uh, you know, it's an instantaneous, more or less instantaneous uh, uh, kick, you know. It moves from here to there. And it gets back to the spiral. So. Of course, you know, during the motion, it will not visit anymore this part of the spiral, so it will go from here to there, get back up, again here, and get another kick, etc. So this is a way you have a uh, li li limit cycle, which was more or less uh, the invention of Huygens. It's a smart idea. So you have only a kick, you know, it's not something which is as regular as a nonlinear term in the equation, but it is also a nonlinear effect, but you have a kick only at a certain time. 
And so, let me continue. Clocks. There has been, uh, by the way, very little interest in the in the uh, um, in the general theory of clocks. You know, and even now atomic clocks, etc. And for instance, there is no general theory telling what is the ultimate accuracy, ultimate precision one can hope for, for a given clock, you know, as far as I'm aware. Uh, it's an interesting problem because it is connected with the uh, thermal, thermal fluctuation, quantum fluctuation, etc., which are certainly in incidence on the ultimate uh, accuracy of a clock. So, now I'm... So, this is to recall uh, what Poincaré said, you know, uh, he describes oscillating system with losses and energy input, even though this is uh, seen with our eyes of nowadays, you know. But basically, what Poincaré describes are oscillating systems from the point of view of physical, of physical system with losses and energy input by a theory of the dynamical system. So uh, you have the limit cycle, Poincaré map. This is something I already said. Uh, so, this is to remind, to recall the Marconi transmitter. You know, it, he used again as an amplifier the arc lamp, which is what, which is not convenient at all. And and see what is this is also called the singing arc because you know it is oscillating, you know, in, including at the frequencies at audible frequencies. And this is uh, the big device which was made by Marconi to um, generate the oscillation in the antenna, electric oscillation in the antenna. So, ah, so, the, uh, ma, 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 now I'll switch to mathematics, but maybe not for, 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 for all the rest of the talk. So this is the equation which was derived by, actually, by, there was a first it was written for the first time by Rayleigh in another form, and as I said, by Blondel, and it is known now by uh, Van der Poel, the Van der Poel equation. So you have uh, an equation of this form, which is not exactly of the form of the equation of, by Poincaré, because in the nonlinear term, you have a mixture of x dot and a function f of x, which is x squared minus 1. This equation is called the Van der Poel equation. So what is known that if eta is negative, so all the solution uh, tends to, to, to rest, you know, to x equal x dot equal zero. And for eta uh, positive, the uh, only stable solution of this equation is a periodic solution, periodic in time. And uh, there are two, uh, two situations one, one can do a, a, an analysis, detailed analysis of the behavior of the solution of this equation, which is a limit eta small, where we have this uh, calculation of uh, this. Uh, this is a limit of the what is called the Poincaré Andronov uh, bifurcation, and I'm not going to say uh, anything on this. And what I'll be interested in is the limit eta large, which was the limit studied by uh, by Van der Poel numerically again. So what you observe, what he observed without explanation, by the way what you observe is that when eta is large, there is, are two stages in the solution of this equation. There is a first stage of decay of x as a function of time, and then a very quick jump from a positive to a negative value. This is, I think, if I remember, this is for eta equal 10, something like that. Hmm? 100. This is for eta equal 100. For eta equal 100, so you have a, a very fast decay, then a, a, somehow a slow recovery of x, a big jump to a positive value, a slow decay, etc. So the oscillations are periodic, but with two dif very well defined different stages a stage of slow motion and a stage of very fast motion. In this limit, eta large. So, we, with Martin, we, we got interested into this problem because, uh, to come back to, 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 there is a, uh, this, at least, this Van der Poel equation 
is very interesting because it is a simple model where you have a transition from a, in the same equation from something which is very slow, very slow dynamics, and a very fast dynamics. And there, there are very natural, very many natural phenomena where you have also this kind of transition. So the most remarkable one, which I've been studying uh, recently, is um, it's not periodic in time. You know, it, uh, is an explosion of supernovae. In the explosion of supernovae, you have an explosion that lasts about 10 seconds. And the time of evolution, the slow time scale, is uh, of the order of 1 billion years. So the ratio of time scale is 10 to the 14. So you have really a very large or a very small parameter, depending on where you put the denominator and the numerator. And in this, this is probably the most extreme case, where in the same physics, because there is no, uh, you know, the physics remains the same, you have, uh, in the same physical problem, you have a very, very different time scale. Uh, and uh, uh, you have also the, the other uh, example where you have di very different time scale, and I will come back to that, is the uh, case of, um, of the um, earthquake. In the earthquake, uh, an earthquake lasts uh, less than uh, a minute. You know, it's about uh, 10 seconds or 20, uh, 12 seconds, 12, 20 seconds. And the, the time scale, the time interval between major earthquake is in the range of 100 or 200 years. There, the ratio is about 10 to 9, but it is also a very, very large time. So uh, we, we, we were interested with Martin in this, uh, the study of this problem, because uh, the idea we had is that uh, by understanding how do you, how does the transition from the slow phenomenon to the fast phenomenon occurs, might help in some case, in some specific cases, particularly for earthquake, to manage to predict the occurrence of the uh, very fast phenomenon on the long time scale. Maybe there is something in between an acceleration that could be uh, a way of predicting how does one uh, do the transition. So maybe I'll jump to, to there. So this is the Lienard, um, the Lienard representation of the Van der Poel equation. Uh, so you have a uh, slow, a, a stable manifold, a stable, no, a slow manifold, sorry, it's not stable, a, a slow manifold, which is this manifold here. Basically, you, this is the, the so y is an integral of, it doesn't matter too much, uh, y is, is found by integration by a first integration, if you wish, of this equation. So, uh, in the equation, uh, the uh, x derivative is very large. It is eta times la, uh, it is eta times the uh, derivative of y, y dot. So you have a slow drift, and again in the limit eta large, you have a slow drift of the representative point. We are again in the realm of Poincaré, you know, we are drawing everything uh, in a phase place, in phase plane, y and x. Y you can see as x dot. It is not exactly x dot, but it, it is uh, basically the same quantity. So you have a slow drift along this curve. You see that this uh, cubic here, which is a slow manifold, is attracting everywhere. It is attracting because the x derivative is much larger than the y derivative in the limit eta large. So it, the, every point starting away from the, from the cubic will uh, be attracted to the cubic. But what happens is that you have a slow, uh, the cubic is not a line of fixed point. It is, there is a small drift in the y direction because the y dot is not zero. There is slow drift to, uh, along the, uh, the slow manifold. Uh, uh, this slow drift is going upward on the right part of the, the, the plane and downward there. So you see that starting from this point, you drift on the slow manifold along this slow manifold here, but here you reach the extreme point on the slow manifold and jump out of the slow manifold because the drifting continues. And then the point is taken by the very large velocity in the uh, horizontal direction, and it is uh, it, it goes along this uh, uh, red, 
red arrow, the velocity in the x direction, and then reach this point there and drift again along the slow manifold, along the to the to this point, and then to the slow manifold like, to the very fast drift there from here from this point to that point, and there again. So you have basically this explains this <coughs> relaxation oscillation. The relaxation oscillation you have the slow part which are a drift along the slow manifold, a slow manifold which is slow because the velocity uh, in the x direction is much bigger, uh, the velocity perpendicular or more or less perpendicular to the slow manifold is much larger than the velocity along the slow manifold. This is this part of the drift, but you reach at this point the extreme point and jump from this extreme point to the other extreme point. This point is this point over there, and then you have the drift there from here to there, etc., etc. So this uh, story was understood in terms of uh, qualitatively understood by uh, Lienard in 1928, and, and there is other paper by Lienard also. But the details of what happens when the, the point, representative point, takes off from the slow manifold there and lands on the slow manifold here was understood by, uh, in the, as I said, in 1947 by Doron Nitsin. Well, this is a tricky, uh, a tricky uh, problem you know, to understand how things happen in, in detail. <coughs> but to, sorry, to come back to, 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 to this picture, so what you have here, and what, this is what we are, we are very interested in, so you have basically from the point of view of the uh, stability in the transverse direction, here you have a point which is unstable because you know that the, uh, the blue arrows point outward from the slow manifold, and here at this point the black, uh, the blue arrow point towards the slow manifold. And at this point, when you look at the uh, at the uh, dynamics in the uh, in the x direction, you have a a, a the merging of an unstable fixed point and of a stable fixed point at this point, which is you have a kind of dynamical uh, dy uh, saddle node bifurcation. Mm. And a dynamical saddle node bifurcation, uh, you, you have a, you can be represented by a one dimensional equation, uh, uh, which is written over there x dot equal minus dv over dx, v is a cubic, and you have a parameter b. When B, I think, when B is negative, you have two fixed points. You have this fixed point, which is uh, the stable fixed point. You have the unstable fixed point. At B equals zero, you have a cubic, so there is a metastable point. And when B becomes uh, slowly positive, you have a, a no stable point anymore. So you have a merging of the two uh, fixed points, uh, stable and unstable, and a disappearance of the uh, fixed point of uh, any uh, stable point. So by analyzing what happens, uh, which was done by, by, um, uh, by uh, Dorodnitsin, well, what Dorodnitsin showed is that for the problem of transition, of, of the slow to, fast transition, slow to fast transition, in this equation you have to have a slowly depending, uh, time depending B. So you have B depends on time, but very slowly, so that you you sweep again, you sweep across this uh, 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 this picture, you know, from here to there. And uh, by rescaling the equation, so near near the uh, near the transition, you have this universal equation x dot equal x square plus t. X square is there because this is a derivative of the cubic uh, force. And uh, you look at, uh, at the solution of this equation with, where at minus infinity you are in the, in the stable fixed point. So the x is like minus, uh, I think there should be a minus square root here. No? Hmm? Minus square root of minus t. And this equation can, be fortu can fortunately be solved by uh, using the equation of Re. So you have x. Uh, as, a, is a, is a, some, as, a, as a function of time, you know, which is x is a, what happens in the direction of x, in the horizontal direction as a function of time, and at 
there is a singularity at 2338, which is a time where the approximation of the cubic potential by uh, the, the approximation by the cubic uh, potential there is not valid anymore, so you have to have uh, higher, uh, higher uh, order terms. Mm -hmm. So this is done by uh, uh, x dot by adding to the potential a one for x to the fourth, and now you know the uh, rolling down stops when the particle reaches the bottom of the potential. So with this, um, with this uh, uh, modelization with the uh, cubic term, with the cubic term now in the equation, we have uh, something which is much, uh, which has no no singularity after a finite time, and uh, so let me. So there is a, but what is interesting from the from the initial point of view is that in this uh, framework there is a, a, a long time scale, which is, as, a, as I said at the beginning for the application, is very long time scale, which is a, the ripening time, temps de maturation, and there is the very quick time, oh, sorry. Uh, 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 ah, merde. Uh, ah. Uh, there is, this is a long time scale because A is, is large, because A is small, there is a time scale, which is a short time scale, which is one, and there is an intermediate time scale, which, is, which was found, by the way, by Barry Doronitsin, which is a to the power minus one third. So you have an intermediate in this phenomenon, at least the result of this analysis, is that before the catastrophe, you have a long time scale, which is intermediate between the short and long time. So what we did with Martin was, to, and maybe I won't tell too much on that because, uh, is that you can detect, uh, and this was done. Um, this was done in an experiment with what, in, in, which was done in the U.S. And this theory, at least, is successful in one experiment. You know, where, where you have we observe this uh, time, this kind of, of intermediate time scale. So how much time do we have? No time. Five minutes. So, uh, what I, I, maybe for the most interesting part of this work for for, for this uh, audience is a stick slip model. So, one could ask the following question. So, we have this phenomenon of transition from slow to fast phenomenon, and which is well explained by uh, by the um, Van der Poel equation in the Van der Poel equation. So, this is what we call the saddle node bifurcation. Uh, so saddle node bifurcation with a uh, dynamical, it is dynamical because there is a slow sweeping from the, across the, uh, across the, uh, the, the, across the transition. So is it, is this only possibility for having any, in a differential equation, a um, transition from slow to fast? And the answer is no. We studied with Martin um, the, this model of, uh, what is called stick slip behavior. So you have a mass which is uh, drawn on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a solid surface, so there is a, some friction, and the mass is, is drawn by a, a point moving with velocity V naught and a, a spring of, of strength K. So this is a classical model for, for earthquake. And in this model, there is a parameter, you know, there are many parameters, and, and uh, here is a parameter gamma. The parameter gamma for earthquake is very, uh, very large. You know, this represents more or less the strength of the, of the friction compared to the strength of the, of the spring here. And what happens in this model? Yeah, so this model is, as, as you may have noticed, is a, a, a system of three uh, a set of three ordinary differential equations, which are written here. And in this, maybe, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I need. so what happens in this model is interesting. It is not at all what happens in, this is a three-dimensional model. This is not at all what you have in the, um, in the saddle load bifurcation of, of the uh, Van der Poel model. In, the, in this model, by restricting the equation to the, uh, 
to the slow manifold, because there is also a slow manifold, what one has is that the trajectory remains on the slow manifold, but on the slow manifold, the equation, the dynamical equation, have a finite time singularity. So after a, some time, the slow manifold is uh, the, the point, representative point, uh, get out of the slow manifold just because it accelerates too much. You know, in some sense, the assumption of, of, of having something slow doesn't work anymore. So there is a transition to another kind of, 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 of dynamics. And you see that this is what happens there. So you have this um, the trajectory, which is uh, it's not very easy to draw, you know, because it is in three dimensions. You have a surface. The slow manifold is a surface, which is in gray here. And the particle accelerate, accelerate, and leave uh, leave the slow manifold in this direction, make a big turn, and come back to the slow manifold, make a large turn there, goes back, goes away from the slow manifold, and again and again. So in some sense, this is a second way for a system to have this relaxation os oscillation. And so it, some, somehow it is kind of, of, of uh, I would say, a point of mathematics, but it is not completely indifferent, because if uh, no. uh, well, maybe I'm not going to explain that. But uh, if one wants to, to, to you know, the, the uh, precursory, possible precursory phenomena for, of, for the transition are completely different in this case than they are in, in, uh, in the case of, of, uh, of the um, transition by the uh, salon node bifurcation. So it is a complete an another class or another uh, class of transition from slow to fast that you find in this uh, uh, <coughs> in this model of, of friction. So I think I, I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you for the very nice talk. Are there questions? Par le fort. Par le fort. Speak yeah, you, you didn't mention uh, many people who studied this kind of phenomena using non-standard analysis. Could, could you comment on this? Which phenomena? Well, uh, the, the approach to, to the slow manifold and uh, the, the times uh, of uh, exit well, and things like that. I think I mentioned the you know, I've not used any other. Yeah, I know, I know that, of course, you know, there are many followers, but what, what we are doing, uh, use mostly or only, I think, the ordinance. But this is, the original part is, is in, as far as I'm aware, is new. Yes, thank you very much for this talk, Eve. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Poincaré was very much interested in, um, in uh, TSF, um, wireless telegraphy. Uh, following uh, Marconi's exploit uh, in 1902, that's, that's true. But of course, his, his interest predated that, and there's his correspondence with the, with Hertz uh, from uh, 1890 yeah, yeah. already. Yeah, but Hertz uh, didn't make any transmission. You know, sure. Uh, the, yeah. the point the point I'm making is is that uh, you you talk about uh, long distance telegraphy, but certainly that's that's not really related to the work that he did at the uh, on uh, generating the waves. Uh, the, from a mathematical standpoint, these these are quite different, aren't they? I mean, you've got one problem generating the waves themselves, and the other part is is studying their transmission uh, over long distances. So um, my question is: Is there any relationship between these two problems, other than the fact that they're they're both uh, tangentially related I to wireless? No, you know, at least what, no, no. What my point was to say, more or less, to describe what is in uh, this 1908-1909 paper. You know, the first part is about the uh, working of an antenna. You know, he computes uh, various uh, geometrical configuration for antenna. And how does it define the, the geometry of the antenna? Def, de, defines the uh, geometry of the field in, at, at, at large distances. And in the second part, you know, without uh, with, with no transition, he switched to, to this kind of equation. That's it. You know. Thank you so much.